So, good morning, church. God is good. God is good. All the time. God is great. Hallelujah. If you're happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning, shout hey, hallelujah. hallelujah. You guys can do better. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, and this morning, sing along with us this morning as we sing about God's grace, how he's forever faithful. Amen. God is faithful, he's always strong, he's always with us, and because of that, we want to give him all the glory and honor that he deserves, amen? Welcome to those who are joining us online, just worship along with us with this morning, sing along with us. Give thanks to the Lord, our God in
because of that, I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Sing along with us.
worship you because of who you are, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider, Jehovah.
sacrifice for the Lord. Let's bless the Lord. Can we sing that song? And everything that you have, bless the Lord this morning. Your hands got breath in them. Your lungs, that song says, it's your breath, God, in my lungs. Amen. Amen. So let's worship him. To find that sweat in each other. So that God in the front, but only for the first all of Let God know. Give him your offering and praise. to that broken heart. Minister to that person that needs Jesus this morning. Father, as we pray this morning, we remember our online viewers. Bless them this morning, Lord God. Encourage them and let them know that you're still in control. The world can be in chaos, but you're in control of our lives because you love us. You love us. And Lord, thank you so much. Tamale me tayao. Manuia mailo mulotu. 
le asima na onga petele ve la titi o esilafia. Le ngate le ya imato lo inele magmalu la tupoi lo. My God, my God, let you let me make time. Bless us, Lord. Bless those that are visiting with us. Bless our missionary, JJ, who's with us. Lord, let him bring forth a message from you. Holy Spirit, anoint your servant this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all your goodness and your mercy. And Father, forgive us all our shortcomings and our sins. In Jesus' holy name. We pray. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. God is good. All the time. Sometimes. All the time. All the time. Hallelujah. I want to be here. 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 Malama tuai ya manui ya meumba ile fatsa si mai le tua lo malama mai foi le sunga ya vito mara inga le tayao Father we pray traveling mercies for Pastor Vito Safai and the children as they travel back they're driving back so we need to cover them with prayers Amen so keep them in your prayers and. I just see a few people, faces I haven't seen before. I think two. The rest of you, we're acquainted with one another in some way, shape, or form. Say amen. amen. JJ, we'd like to welcome you, our missionary from uh, to Spain. Amen. So he's a missionary to Spain. And we're so blessed that he's here. He was supposed to come next week, but JJ, he's probably leaving next week to go back to Europe for... So we're, we're blessed to have JJ here. Um, we uh, picked up JJ at the end of April to support him. And, and uh, thank you for the call. Because I think we, we were in Long Beach the last time we met you with your wife and your children was in Long Beach, California, at New Life Long Beach, Brother uh, Solomon's Church. You know, so, uh, JJ called me and I said, I just don't remember JJ Farrell on our list of missionaries. And then I say, but then, you know, but I knew the name, you know, just couldn't place the face because it looks like he gets younger every time I see him. <laughs> Maybe you should go up here. I'm just kidding. But he's here with us and he's also going to be here tonight to uh, bless the youth service tonight. So we're blessed to have him. And uh, so we're here. Uh, Tasha, or yeah. the boy said Tasha. I thought it was another Tasha. That's a friend of ours too. Uh, but Tasha, we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, anybody else, Josh? We have anybody else that's been here? Just you, <laughs> Josh. You're buying bunch of the Lord. Um, yeah, we're at our uh, the your favorite time of the service is offering. Say amen. Yeah. All right. I hear the kids say this is their favorite time. So we're going to bless the Lord and call up our deacons and come and, uh, and uh, receive our tithes and offering as they come. Ask uh, Brother Langa to say a prayer to bless our offering. And after he prays, we're going to stand up and they're going to stay here. And we're going to sing a song and they're going to come and uh, uh, Drop your offering inside the basket or the uh, offering bag. And just go around and uh, say hi to somebody. High five them if they're okay with that. You know, but just uh, bless someone this morning uh, with your presence. Amen. So let's pray, Brother Langa. <laughs> Now we stand, don't bring your own uh, all this morning. Joy is here, wake up. Joy is here, wake up. 
Uh, the one that I sent to that, that the Assemblies of God World Missions, they get on to me and say, you need to send in a new picture. And I just, and I used to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sending it in. I sent an email, you know. And I just tell them, I'm never going to give you a new picture. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so I think they stopped me on Facebook and they found that. Uh, the other one was with my daughter. I think she was like two. That's the one that I would like for them to keep. But anyway, my, my family, uh, my son, who is the, you know, he's the one right there. He's 19 years old right now. So he obviously looks nothing like in that picture. Thank God. Uh, he's 19 years old. He grew up on the mission field. When we go back, uh, he stays. He's in college, first year of college. He's doing great. Thank God. We realized few years ago that he wasn't going to be a, uh, he's not going to be, you know, he's not going to be an astronaut. <laughs> so he's doing better than he's ever done before in school, thank God. Those parents, sometimes your kids will just snap out of it. And that's the case with my son. He snapped out of it. And uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a rocket musician. He, he plays, he plays the electric guitar. By the way, let me just say, I am blessed Every time, I, 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 not every time I go to small churches. Sometimes I have a Most of the time, man, you guys get down. You, you make it happen. Now, why didn't you tell me when we were eating catfish that you are an amazing worship leader? So my son plays the electric guitar. He's, uh, he is, uh, he has a, a, a Christian blues band called Caden and the Fillions, and he just released his second his second blues album. Oh, wow. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my son. My daughter, she is uh, always she's a lot bigger now. She's 15, going on 25. <laughs> and any any of you mothers and fathers who've ever had 15 year old daughters in the home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. She's the smartest person in the home. She's a genius. She knows everything. Um, so we keep our eye on her, and I have to remind the boys, hey, I know what a shovel does. You just keep digging. You put anything, and you just cover up, and it's gone. <laughs> you know how that works. My wife is forever 25. <laughs> God. And I'm the ugly one in the black shirt. Anyway, so we're the Pharaohs, and we've been missionaries for, for a little while. So, I'm, I, you know, it's been a while since I've been to this church. Last time I was here, it's probably been a good, close to, I don't know, 15, 20 years. It's been a long time. And I doubt if anybody remembers me, because that's just how it works. Um, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, why it is we do what we do? Why do we do youth ministry of all things? That's the biggest piece of what we do. We do youth ministry, but I'm going to tell you why. Um, I grew up I grew up in that home. My dad was an alcoholic. My, my upbringing was every bit of an alcoholic home. And if you have, any of you have had the, if any of you grew up like that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. A lot of fighting, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, breaking things. My earliest childhood memory, I think I was three years old watching cartoons. And I, I saw my dad break down the door to get to my mom. And a whole lot of days just like that. Um, when I was 11 years old, my dad died as a result of all of his drinking. And it, it, it wound up just taking his life. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I, you know, I, I joined that neighborhood gang. It was nothing like what I thought it would be, and I won't glorify a day of it. Uh, by, the, by the time I was a young teenager, I remember waking up in the morning and just thinking, man, there my sisters were using drugs. I was running around, you know, a bunch of knuckleheads. Uh, I remember, I remember walking to school as a, you know, walking to high school and looking at other people as they're walking by and thinking, man, I bet they have books in those backpacks. And just thinking, man, something's got to be wrong because nobody even. It seemed like nobody cared that I was. No one, no one asked me how my. Homework was. No one asked me if I was doing homework. Nobody asked me what my grades were. I, I didn't care about anything. I didn't care about anybody. I barely cared about myself. Uh, and I, I remember just, I, don't, I wasn't thinking suicidal thoughts necessarily, but I remember just thinking, man, this world is, is a hopeless place. And there, I didn't have one thing to look forward to. And I remember uh, seeing bad things happen to bad people. And uh, 
and being ashamed of myself for everything that I got myself into, I, I had, I had a, I had a, well, I had a night, and I got home, and I remember just looking at myself in the mirror and just thinking, Jade, you're gonna die from all of this. And I had a, I had a moment where I realized that something has to, something significant has to change, or it's not gonna go well for me. And and I, I wasn't, I didn't try, I wasn't trying to pray, but my, my soul cried out, and I said, help me, God. A um, couple days later, someone invited me to go to a youth group, and I had no idea what a youth group was. I didn't, I honestly didn't know that it was church until I got dangerously close to that church parking lot. Uh, I remember sitting in the car and just thinking, man, I I don't know if I can do this. You know, we walked into the, the back of a, of a youth room. It was a, it was a, it was a room about this size. They said there were like 250 teenagers in there. Of course, this was pre-COVID, you know, you that sort of thing back then. This was 1990, whatever it was. Uh, we're looking in and kind of scanning the crowd. And I had never... I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't, I, I didn't know anybody who was going to church except for this one person who invited me to come to this youth group. Uh, I was sitting in the back of that, of that youth room, that church for teenagers. For about 10 minutes, I stood in the back there just trying to get up enough courage to walk down the aisle to sit next to my friend. And I guess I was, I was trying to figure out if I was going to do it or not. You know? But... I remember after about 10 minutes, I realized what I realized what God was doing. You know, I actually cried out to him. And he has really big ears and he hears everything. And, and he was throwing me a lifeline. And I had never experienced worship before. I didn't know what it felt like. Man, I, I felt I felt the presence of the Lord today. I really did. But I felt the, I felt the presence of the Lord that day as well. First time of my life, man, it, it, it was it was something sweet, and I wanted more of it. I really did. Yeah. And I remember about ten minutes went by, and and I I said probably the most dangerous words that anybody could ever say. We were talking about dangerous words last night. You gotta be careful what you say to the Lord. I said, Lord, take this life of mine and do whatever you want to do with me. Just make life worth living, please. Uh, that was that was the day. I, I got saved. And I don't know about you. When I came to the Lord, I was, it was a mess. I was a mess. And I needed to be cleaned up. And the Lord took a took a, a broken person who was nowhere. I mean, I was nowhere near as tough as I thought I was. Man, I, you think I'm skinny now. <laughs> you see me then. <laughs> uh, and that not long after, not long after I got saved, the Lord started dealing with me about how there are places in this world. Where, where they don't have what we have. You know? and, and talking about youth ministry. Man, it took a youth ministry for me to find Jesus. And I, and I, I strongly believe even today that if, if I wouldn't have had a local, if my church wouldn't have had a local youth ministry, I don't know where I would have stumbled in that night. But it definitely wouldn't have been a church. You know, and, and I don't, I still don't think, I still think that if I wouldn't have had a local youth ministry in that local church, I don't think I would have ever found the Lord. I really don't. And there are, there are kids out there that are just like me. Hello. <laughs> there are kids out there that are just like me. You know, it, 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 they're not going to find Jesus unless someone is going to, unless their local church is going right. to preach it in a way that they're going to understand it. Yeah. The Lord started dealing with me about, about how I was put on this earth to, to minister to teenagers. And I, somehow, and I, somehow, he was going to use me to, to make youth ministries happen in places where it doesn't already happen. So uh, I think that we have a, a, a unique ministry. And if it doesn't sound unique to, me, to you, then, you know, humor me later. <laughs> I'll tell you what, what it is that, we're, that we do. You know, I, I have been serving in Romania for a number of years. I went there in uh, 1996, some of you 
We're not born in 1996. <laughs> Life did exist. The 1990s were real. It's not, it's not folklore. I went, I went to Romania 25 years ago. Uh, we, we, I've always been a youth pastor in a local church. We started the local, we started in the, the two different churches where I've been the, the youth pastor. We started the, that local youth ministry. We have a ministry of helping other churches to start youth ministries. So we also are ministering a lot in a lot of different places, helping other churches to just start a youth ministry. Um, and I, I also have the, the privilege of, of teaching youth ministry in Bible schools because the reality is, you know, that there's not a there's not a whole lot of youth ministry that's happening outside of the United States. That's right. Some of you can can attest to that. Some of you know that firsthand. Uh, so if if you're not training leaders and you know helping people to understand what youth ministry is, it's 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 just not going to happen. So we also teach youth ministry in Bible schools. Uh, beyond that, way, I also you know this is kind of where I start to pinch myself, and I promise you, I I am not. I don't think that I'm somebody. If anything, I'm, I am grossly underqualified for almost everything that the Lord has me doing. I think that there's probably someone out there who's a lot smarter than me that said no to the Lord, and he, God just said, okay, let's just send in JJ. <laughs> I, I get to work with, with, with the national youth directors across the whole continent of Europe. All the stuff that I've been doing in, in Romania for all these years, about 10 years ago, 15 years, I don't know, the, the years kind of blend. The Lord pulled out a key and he unlocked the doors of the whole continent. I get to be a, a youth, yes. and you guys remember what youth camps were like? Yes. So we just went to youth convention. Yes. Hey, do you remember what those youth camps were like? Those altar calls, people being saved, yeah. baptized in the Holy Spirit, called into ministry. Man, I get to do that stuff all over the place. All of those countries that you've ever heard about in Europe that you want to go visit, I've preached in most of them two or three times. If you ever want to know, you know, those dingy, grungy places in Europe, you know, those places you don't want to visit, I've preached in about, I've preached in those places a good four or five times each. Um, a lot, I have a show the, the green slide, please. A lot of places that I go, you know, it's really polished. You're you know, you're preaching to 1,000 teenagers, 2,000 teenagers, whatever it is, you know, and, and they've got the big screens and the smoke and the lights and, you know, the music is awesome. But a lot of places that I go, next slide, please, it's just grassroots. You go to a local church and you help them to start a local youth ministry and, you know, three, four, five years down the road, you look back and you say that they will never go to the place where they didn't reach teenagers ever again. Because they, they know the power of, of reaching that next very open generation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, I, I work a lot with, these, with the national youth directors for, in the Pentecostal circles in Europe. And what I tell people we do, it's we just roll out the map of Europe, put our fingers on the pulse, try to figure out what the Holy Spirit is doing across the continent, see if there's anything that we're missing. And we look for the dark spots, trying to find where, where are the places where we, we don't hear about youth ministry happening. Right. And we just start going in and, and start pushing those buttons. Amen. Trying to do anything we can to help those churches to start youth ministry. Yeah. Now, I, I work with, with the denominations of entire, entire countries. Again, this is, <coughs> honestly, I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm really, I'm a nobody. It sounds big, but I'm a nobody. Okay? We work with, a, with an entire denomination and help them figure out how do you get a how do you get a strategy for youth ministry, and then how do you roll it out and, and make it happen all across the country? Man, it, I do a lot of training, a lot of working with churches, a lot of uh, a lot of hanging out with with uh, national superintendents, the people that are responsible for the for the the Pentecostal movement in their country, and yeah. convince them that the best thing that you can do for your country is to make sure that every local church has a local youth ministry because every church needs one. That's, uh, I guess that's the boring way of describing what it is that we do. We also have, uh, we also do a lot of compassion ministry. Man, they're just hurting people in this world. Next slide, that's my, that's my secret. We work, we, we work a lot with, especially in the gypsy culture. If you guys, you guys know what gypsies are? Gypsies in Europe, 
They, it doesn't matter what country you're in, they don't like them. They are the most hated people in, in the whole continent of Europe. And I don't know why, but somehow the Lord has, they like me for some reason. <laughs> and, you know, Lord's favor or something like that. You know, so we, man, we, get to, we get to work a lot with these gypsy people. And I tell you, to say that, that they're not liked is, is really just an understatement. They, the help in a country does not get to them. The aid, the government aid, all that stuff, the, the organizations that are in, in these poor countries, it just, it, for, for the most part, doesn't get to gypsy people. So one of the things that, one of the issues that we have, especially in Eastern Europe with gypsy kids, is that this isn't legal, but it happens. Uh, if they don't have all the school supplies that they need on the first day of school, if they don't, you know, look the part, smell the part, and they're not ready for school by about day two or three, they're not going to be welcomed back. And you're talking about very, very poor sectors of society. If, if these people are not allowed to go to school, a third grader can't go to school, they're just going to hang out in that vicious cycle of, of poverty their whole life, and their kids and their grandkids will be there. You need to cut that off. We know that you know for 20, 30 bucks, we can put everything inside of a bag and give to a child, and they will be able to go to school for the whole year. You know, we like to do what I what I call strategic help, where you know you can you can I used to do this, so nobody get nobody be upset by what I'm saying. When I first went to Romania, I was working with, with homeless kids, and that's 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 the biggest piece of what we were doing. We're working with homeless children. It's a beautiful thing. You know, if you see somebody hungry, just feed them. Don't wait for somebody to, you know, get a organization or a plan or whatever. Man, if you see somebody hungry, just give them some food. Okay? Yeah. Well, we, I would walk the streets, not my, just myself. We were a team of people. We would walk the streets with these double bags full of sandwiches. And there were just thousands of, of homeless people, homeless <coughs> children. We were looking for the kids that were living down in those sewers. And you walk around and you see the, a kid and you, you give a child a sandwich. This is a beautiful thing. This is the part where you might get mad at me, but don't do it. Okay? I realized after a while that you know, as you're handing a, a sandwich to somebody, sometimes they tell you about a real problem. And you say, well, I have a sandwich. And then you, you realize, I realized often, I started getting, saying this phrase, yeah, I have a sandwich. In other words, I, I can't fix that problem. And I got sick of that. And so now what, what we like to do, what we really like to do, is we like to look at a need, a real need. We find a family. We find families that have real needs. And we say, okay, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. It's not going to be everybody gets a sandwich today. Find a family that has a real need. And we go in there and fix that need. Next slide. Please. Thank you. We like to help out, especially around, around the holidays. I don't know if you've ever been broke around before Christmas or Easter or you know birthdays or these kinds of things, man. If you're broke and you've got little kids and you know that every other family on the block, they're gonna they're gonna find something under that tree on Christmas morning and you can't do it, that that'll hit you pretty hard and that's gonna mess those kids up too. But we we like to go we like to help around the Christmas time, you know, especially finding families that can't do it. But we're always just looking while as we're going out trying to see what what are the real needs. This family, obviously, they, they've got some medical issues that they're, that they're dealing with. Single dad, the mom split on them because there was too much, too much reality for her to deal with, so she skipped town and left, you know, home the, left her kids with the dad. Uh, so dad's hanging on and he's doing everything he can. We're there trying to evaluate and see if there's anything we can help out with. My, my wife went inside of this home and he, the dad was going to give us the one thing that he could probably afford to say thank you, which was a cup of coffee. And uh, as he's as he was going to the to the refrigerator to get some milk out of out of the fridge, because you know I drink cream with my coffee. Uh, my wife said that as he was opening up the fridge, he was holding the refrigerator door with his with his foot, and she was looking to see what what's going on. And she said, well, the, the hinges, 
that were holding the refrigerator door on. They were all rusted. And, and she said, is there something we can do to help out with this? You know, what does strategic help do? Uh, two or three hundred bucks. We, they have bigger problems to deal with than just a dumb fridge that doesn't open right. I don't, know, I don't know how many of you have to hold on to the refrigerator door with your foot. I don't. So we took, I think, of $200 and we went we found a secondhand fridge and, and fixed the problem. They, they've got other things they need to worry about. They don't have to worry about the refrigerator. Church, thank you very much for everything you're doing for the cause of missions. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Church, for everything that you're doing and all that you're, you're giving to, to missions. I, I, I know some of those missionaries that are that are in the back wall over there. And I know I know that some of them are, you know, some of them are gonna tell the stories really well. Others are, are not gonna tell the stories so well. Some people are just not good storytellers. <laughs> but but I promise you, if you would see them in action, if you if you would see them in action, you would know that everything that you're doing, everything that you're giving, for the cause of, of of taking the gospel to other lands, then those guys, those people are heroes. Please pray for them, support them, and do anything you can. I have to ask you a very important question. Pastor, what time should I be done? <laughs> we don't get out until uh, You know, I, I like we don't get out until what time. <laughs> I, I like the smaller churches and I like the Hispanic churches. Man, it's just like, just keep going. No. But I gotta ask, you know, someone who's what time should we be done? <laughs> so if you saw me playing on my phone before service, uh, I was soul searching and trying to figure out you know, why doesn't why don't things feel right today and uh, I don't have the typical uh, I have a word to share with you today and and it's not it's not my it's not my normal uh, it's not my normal missionary service message but I have a message for some of you today I think I have a message for all of us today and I think I have a message for myself today so where's the mirror Look at myself. You know, I, I remember being a new believer. I remember being new in the Lord and just flipping through those through those pages in the Bible. And and I remember reading the, the amazing stories of, of what the what the Lord did. You know, and I, I remember, you know, reading about when Moses went up and you know he he led the people of Israel through the Red Sea. I had heard about that. I heard about it a few times in my life. But I remember reading it in the scriptures and thinking, that really happened. And, and thinking, man, to, to have been one of those people that walked through dry ground and looking at the water on the left and the right, I remember thinking, man, it must have been easy to serve the Lord then. Go it would have been easy for me, you know. <laughs> and then you see these you see these Israelites out in the desert and all the ways that that, that the Lord was providing for them. And seeing all the, the miraculous things that happened, you know, Moses took that stick and he, you know, whacked the rock and then out gushes water. It must have been easy to serve the Lord then. And then you you keep going through through the have you did have any of you ever thought those things? She's gonna come up and help. Someone get her a mic. She's gonna prophesy. And I remember you know going through and then you get to you get to the prophets you you get to the judges and seeing how the mighty hand of the Lord worked in in those those people. And you know we we get the we get this this sense that you know they were there was something different about them. Man, they were pretty normal people. I promise you, because I've met some pretty amazing people. And as you get to you get to really know them, you like, man, you just drive a Honda. You're just like a normal <laughs> dude. 
And I remember, you know, reading about the, the prophets and the, and, and the amazing things that, that the Lord was doing. And I remember just always getting that sense that, man, I wish I, wish I would have lived then. I wish that I would have been alive then. Because, man, I would have served God. And it would have been an easy thing to do because I saw the stuff. And then I remember, you know, getting to the New Testament and seeing, seeing Jesus in action. He was healing people. He was raising people from the dead for crying out loud. He was, you know, casting out demons and, and all these miraculous things happened. I couldn't figure out why did he turn water into wine? He turned into something else, but he did, you know, he does whatever he wants to do. You know, I, I remember... You know, reading these these stories, these things, and just saying, man, I wish I would have, I wish I would have been there. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite one, one of one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Then I like it now too. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> Jesus went up on the mountainside all night long and he prayed, <coughs> and he came down, and then he started calling out these names. And the Bible says that he was, he was choosing the 12 people that were going to be the apostles, that were going to, you know, his disciples. They were going to follow him around. And he had all these people there, you know, and, and then he just starts calling out the names. You know, Peter, Andrew, you know, Will, <laughs> JJ, whatever. All these people. I remember just trying to put myself in, into that story and thinking, Man, if I was there, I wonder if he would have called my name. <laughs> Can you imagine being in this a mass of people and just saying, call my name. <laughs> Say my name. Because yeah. I don't know what that apostle thing is, but I will, oh, I want to do it. Yeah. You know, and, and I a couple a couple years later I realized, man, there were, you know, you read about in the Bible about the twelve. Mm -hmm. The 70. Those 70 were there too. They were the ones that were like, you didn't call my name, but I ain't going home. I would follow you anyway. You know, it must have been easy to serve the Lord in those days, right? But it really it wasn't. It's never been easy. It's always been hard. There's always been a, a, a version of hard. I remember going, going to Bible school. And I, I started reading these stories. And this, there was this, there was this book. There was this class called uh, Heroes of the Faith. And it was, it was, it was about the, the history of the Christian church and the people that did amazing things for the Lord. I remember flipping through those, through those, uh, through those stories and they get to this, these black and white photos. Man, all the cool things happen to black and white photos. You know? The people with their cool slicked over hairdos and, you know, the suits and they always had their Bible close so you could see it in the picture. <laughs> and and I, st I remember I remember getting those getting those those feelings again about him. Man, I wish I would have been alive then. There's a really, really famous photo that if any of you will, you have done a uh, 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 history and polity of the assemblies of God in your classes. Probably, right? If you haven't, you will. Okay. There's this really, really famous photo, really famous photo, of uh, not not long after the Azusa Street revival, and then they uh, people are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they they started to figure out, well, okay, what are we gonna, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do? And we're all filled with the Holy Spirit, but man, something's gotta change. And so a bunch of people got together, and this is you know early 1900s, and all these people got together at this kind of this big congress and trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And they all lined up in front of the church. And this is a black and white photo, of course. And there was like 200, I don't know how many of them there are. There's a bunch of people who really became famous people. And they're standing there, you know, taking their picture. And those people had no idea what they were doing what they were a part of. I know they didn't. I, I know that they had no idea that for the next hundred 
hundreds of years probably, people are going to be looking at that photo and say, these guys were the history makers. I know that they didn't know because if you look at this really famous photos, you see bikes turned on the side and hats were kind of placed on the steps. If they would have known what they were getting themselves into, they would have been like, okay, take the bike and put it somewhere else. Put your hats behind us. Get it? Right. Let's take a good photo, guys. That's us, man. That's us. And I tell you, I honestly, truly, genuinely believe that we are living in a generation where people are going to look back our 2020s, as difficult as they've been, people are going to look back on our generation and they're going to be like, man, I wish I would have lived then. And, I, and that's just not, that's not just a nice thing to say. Let me tell you why I think that. Because we're the generation <clears throat> that the Lord has chosen to be here now. And there are a lot of people that are not here now. The Lord has chosen for you to be here now, in this generation, right now. And the church has gone through a lot, and this world has gone through a lot, and there are a lot of hurting people. But the Lord has chosen for us to be here, but we put this thing back on its feet again. So what is your role in all of this? And who are, who are you anyway? You know, we're going through the motions. We're putting, we're putting hats and bikes on the side of our picture. We don't know what we're up to. Something, something amazing is about to happen. And the truth is, the truth is that, that we're, we're all just a bunch of normal people. Yeah. And the Lord is, 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 is looking at us and saying, someone stand up. Yeah. Someone do it. And I promise you, I am living, breathing proof the Lord can use anybody. Amen. There's not a whole lot that's amazing about me or many of the people I hang around with. So I think that the Lord have you ever gotten a sense that as you're reading through the scriptures there's got to be more. There has got to be more serving the Lord than just these four walls. Yeah. There's got to be more to serving the Lord than, than, than what we see happening. And, and that's, that's the feeling that, that I get. And, and who cares about my feelings? But that's, that's what I see when I read through the scriptures because I see things written down. I see things written down. And Jesus, he, everything he said, he meant it. Everything he said, he meant it. Has Jesus ever made a mistake? I'm going to ask you again. Has Jesus ever made a mistake? So when he said that you'll do greater things than these, did, did he mean it? Yes. Yes. He said this. He said, you will do greater things than these. And he wasn't just talking to his disciples. He wasn't. Because if he was, we wouldn't find it written down in Scripture. Yes, he was talking to you, and he was talking to me. He was talking to every normal person that's just laying bikes down on the side of the photo. We're, just, we're, we're here. Yes. Now allow the Lord to use you. There's an ordinary faith that we're learning. We tell you about this ordinary faith. We're just in not, not here in this church. This is the church globe, but you guys are really awesome people. Right? We take this little spoon and we get fed. Okay, if you just sit there and shut up and be quiet, you'll be fine. Oh, you just just read the scriptures. Take that little spoon. Getting fed with that. I mean, you're, not made, you're not made for that. Right. <coughs> you are not made for that. Right. You are made to serve the Lord in a way that when that when you're done with this world, it spins differently. Right. And that's why you are here today. Amen. That's why you exist today. Um, you can sit, you can sit there and do nothing. For the most part, the church will not bug you about that. We, that's the faith that we learn. Okay? But 
we're made for so much more than that. I have a video, and I, I normally show this to teenagers. If you guys haven't been in youth group in a while, you're all honorary 15-year-olds. I have a little video. in this video you can just float through life and you can allow this world around you to die 
and you can uh, you can see hurt happening all around you, and you can, you can just sit there and act like it's not happening. And no one's going to bother you about that. No one will ever bug you. But I know that some of you are, are sitting here today and you're saying, there's, there's, there's more for me. I'm here to serve the Lord in a different way. You know, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, and I know that a lot of you already know this, none of my, none of my slides are going to make any sense anymore. <laughs> Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean? That means that all those things that we've found documented in Scripture, all of those things that we've read from Genesis all the way to Revelation, there's no shock Amen. that we find people in a hundred years ago living their life in, in a different standard because they know Jesus Christ that did things once upon a time in a certain way, man, he does it today as well. Yeah. Today, 2022. The Lord is looking for people to say, I will serve you. Use me. If you, if you care to use me, I'm here to be used. And one, of the, one of the alarms that we see going off in the Christian church is this. We are closing down our Bible schools. They're going bankrupt. Why? Because less and less people are saying, I will serve the Lord. Now, there, people ask me from time to time, when I say time to time, probably about once a week, I'll get cornered somewhere and they'll say, why are you going to Europe? Why do you do this in Europe? Go to Africa where it's hard. Go to, go to Latin America where, you know, you have to go in a canoe or something. Let me tell you something about Europe. They say that, that the church in Europe in our lifetime is going to die. The Christian church in, in Europe is going to die in our lifetime if something significant doesn't change. And when I started hearing those things about 20 years ago, I thought, ah, that, that's, that's, that's not a reality. What's actually happening? The church in Western Europe, all of those beautiful places that everybody wants to go visit, where you, they have these gigantic cathedrals that used to house, you know, 3,000 worshipers would go into these cathedrals in France and, and in London and all these wonderful places that everyone wants to go. Now, you pay a, a, a three euro fee and you go in there and you take pictures. Yeah. And you say, see maybe 10 people and they're worshiping. Now they're museums. Yeah. It's happening. And the, the, the evangelical church, the Pentecostal church, in many of these countries, I'm not going to name them because people will be upset with me. They're selling the churches. And they're saying, well, let's reduce the amount of churches we have. And everybody just kind of, they're, they're selling the churches because they're empty. Something has to happen. Well, I know something about, I know something about the, the church in Europe. The last open people, the last open category of people in the gospel of Jesus Christ are teenagers. They're the last. And we, have, we need to reach them now. Because in 15, 20 years, we're going to miss it. I'll tell you something else about the church in Europe. They say that in 14 years from right now, Islam will be the prominent religion from, from one end of Europe to the next. Islam is on the rise in Europe. And if we don't do something to step in and, and make a significant change, we're going to miss it. The church, once upon a time, the, the, the birthplace of Christianity is, is a place that today we call the Middle East. That was where we had our birthplace in Christianity. We lost our foothold a long time ago. We're going to do it in Europe as well. If we, do we need to reach the young people. We have to. But the Lord doesn't sit on his hands. He doesn't. And uh, I'm going to tell you something about, about what's happening in, in, uh, in Western Europe. Okay? There is a, a growing understanding amongst 12, 13, 14, 15-year-olds in, in the Pentecostal movement in Europe. And these, these young kids are reading the scriptures differently. And they're, they're reading the same Bibles that their parents and grandparents read. But they, they noticed that, you know, Jesus said that we will do greater things than even he did. And they believe him. And, and 
there's a there's a movement that I can't tell you all about it because we don't have time. There's a movement in in Europe called Jesus Revolution, and it's just a bunch of teenagers. They they preach that you find these fourteen year olds preaching the gospel on the street corners and in these in these uh, touristy areas of, of Europe where you've got all these tourists walking by, they're, they're out there preaching the gospel, and it makes the old people mad. It makes them upset. Because it's not, it's not their experience in Christ. But these young people say, well, that's what the apostles did. And I'm supposed to do greater things than they did. How is that ever going to happen if I sit in, a, sit in my, my room yeah. just reading the Bible? i got to get out. Yeah. I go to, I go to these, these meetings where you have all these national youth directors get together. And you know, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. So you get like this one, this one time. It was the coldest I've ever been in my whole life. We went to uh, to Prague in the Czech, Czech Republic. It was like sixty of us that got together, and I kept this was this was a few years ago. I kept on hearing about these Jesus Revolution people, Jesus Revolution, this Jesus Revolution. That, and I heard all these all these stories about them. Um, you tell me a story, I'm going to check it out. And then gonna, someone's going to tell me, oh, something amazing happened. Oh, that's great. And then I'm going to ask somebody. I'm going to find out, this really happened or is this just a nice story. These Jesus Revolution people showed up, and they, they, they sent their national director from the country of Sweden. Okay? He was a kid of like 22 years old. He was like their national guy. Okay? Just a kid. But man, there was something different about these people. They came up, you know, there were a group of like four or five of them, but this, this, this one kid. So we, we head out. You know, we, when you, we all get together, you pray a lot, you do a lot of talking, you do a lot of, you know, some plans or whatever. But then you head out into the city, wherever you're at, to just kind of go look around. But we didn't do that until about 11 o'clock at night. And there was about 60 of us. And we're walking down downtown Prague. It's a beautiful city, but unfortunately I couldn't enjoy it because I felt like my teeth were going to crack because it's freezing cold. <laughs> We're walking, there's a bunch of us, we're all sticking together, and you, you, I heard, and everybody heard off in the distance, these screaming and yelling, and people just, I found out that night that Prague is, is like Europe's Vegas, and especially British kids go to Prague to unwind. They get drunk and do whatever they feel like doing. It's, they do that. Okay, so you, I hear these British people, these kids, Screaming, yelling, kicking over trash cans, cussing at people. And, you know, everybody sees them. They turn in the corner and like, oh, man, there's three of them. They're staying away from them. You know, like 60 people are afraid of them, okay? And mind you, this is the coldest I've ever been in my life, okay? I promise you. One of them, the loudest one, didn't have a jacket on. He had a short sleeve shirt on, and he was, he was red from being frozen. But he was he kicks over another trash can, yelling at everybody. Without, we're all you know going safely away. The Jesus Revolution people, and they didn't skip a beat. They start heading their way, and I thought, time to find out if <laughs> right. any of these people are nuts or something's going to happen. So as they go to them, you know, and I'm going to try and tell you real time how this happened. Okay. They're walking up, they're walking up. The Swedish dude takes off his jacket and comes behind the drunk guy. Didn't say a word to him, just kind of puts his jacket on him. And he's flipping out. Hey, what's going on? He said, whoa, 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 calm down, man. It's cold. And you don't have a jacket on. Where's my jacket? You know, a few choice words here and there. He said, I don't know where your jacket is, but I'm walking that way. And you can wear my jacket until I get cold. And then I'll, you know, warm up and we'll just kind of share my jacket until we part ways. But okay, sounds like a good idea. Without skipping a beat, this Swedish kid looks at him and says, so what do you think about Jesus? What do I think about Jesus? Yeah, what, what do you think about Jesus? You know, God. Uh, well, I don't think he exists. What, what do you mean you don't think he exists? Well, my Jesus is good for my grandma. She goes to church, but everybody prays and nothing ever happens. I said, so I don't, I don't, I don't think I really believe in Jesus. Said, okay, so this is real time how it happened. 
says, so what if we pray for something and, and God answers our prayer? Would you believe? He says, I guess I would, but it's not going to happen. He said, well, what if I pray for you to get sober and God makes you sober? Would you believe? And he kind of stops and he looks at him and he says, yeah, I would believe. He said, well, let's pray. Here? Right here. Let's just pray. So these three drunk British kids kind of, you know, they're laughing about it. And they're kind of joking. And these Jesus Revolution people took a good, you know, 15 seconds of their time to pray that the Lord would sober this, these people up, especially the, the really mean one. You know, no elaborate prayer, nothing sophisticated. They didn't say, no one blew the shofar. You know, it's just a normal prayer. And after about 15 seconds, the British kid starts saying, what's happening? What happened? They said, do you remember what you said? He said, I believe, I believe. Wow. He totally sobered up right in front of my eyes. Wow. I saw this happen with my own eyes. Hey. At, this is, at this point, this is probably like 12 o'clock at night. This Jesus Revolution people just start calling people in, in, in England. They say, hey, do you know somebody? This guy's from a certain town. They say, well, let me give you another number. So now they're calling perfect strangers. They say, hey, I need to find somebody in this town. This guy needs a church. Let me give you another number. These Jesus Revolution people, they're crazy. He's already, at 12 o'clock at night, he's calling perfect strangers. Yeah. To find a good church for that person to go in and then they follow it up with them. Amen, amen. Let me tell you something. I dare you. I dare you to see God through the eyes of one of those Jesus Revolution amen. kids. Yeah. I dare you to see I, I dare you to see God through the eyes of Moses or David. I dare you to see, you know, God through the eyes of those people that are standing in front of the church with a really awesome bike tilted on its side. I dare you to see God through the eyes of you can do it and I am a nobody but I will allow you to please use me because we are made for so much more than just these four walls. I don't know you. I want to be used by the Lord. Some of you you're probably thinking, man, maybe the Lord wants to use me in ministry. Maybe the Lord wants to use me for ministry. And I think that really probably all the time the Lord is dealing with people. It's just they're not dealing back. If you're, if, if you're entertaining those ideas today, take today. Take just today and say, Okay, Lord, if I would serve you in ministry, what would you do with me? And allow the Lord to open that, that door to your heart just a little bit. Pastor, thank you very much for allowing me to come. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. to a funeral this past weekend. One of the great men of God that's been serving our Psalmwood district. And something our superintendent said to his children because they came to memorialize him. He did a lot for our district. And the kids came up and remember everything that their dad did. And they said how they wish they were more out there in ministry. Because life continues, even during ministry. But you have a choice, me and you, you young people. I was listening and our superintendent says that he wished that they would have came sooner to answer what their father had placed in their heart for them to minister. 
Today, I, I, the word that came to me from the Lord to our church that I had to preach to a service. This is from the Lord. Service. So what you going to do? Who are you going to serve? When are you going to serve? Why are you going to serve? How are you going to serve? Everything that JJ was speaking, it's like, Lord, this. But the question is, you hold that key in your hands. Really, it's in the mission field, the local church, and the truth is we do need a young people ministry in every single church. Because sometimes you're the only one that can reach that generation. I can not reach the young people generation. But God is looking for people to say, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Ordinary. Ordinary people. But you got to choose how, how you want to serve. Where you going to serve. When you all stepped out of the day, as JJ said, ordinary. Ordinary. We don't have to do extraordinary stuff. You have to do just the ordinary things. But you have to say, Lord, I don't want to do that. Because if you don't, and then you might have been the best qualified, but you said no. And the, the Lord just keeps moving. Service. Serve God now. Serve Him where He wants you to serve. Some of you, you know you got a call. But you, there's always that insecurity. If you send me somewhere, Lord, how am I going to live? But let's start by just saying, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go. Send me. Send me. Send me in the local church to establish that one ministry you want me to establish. Just gotta say yes. Yes, Lord. Amen. Can we stand? Great word this morning. One of the things that we're pushing in our district is more young people to send to the mission. young lady that we sent to Nepal, she came back for her one year of, uh, what do you call that mission? Yeah, of going there for one year. Associate minister. Yeah, so she came back. And here's what she said to the, to the, uh, one of the uh, presbyter under her section. She said, come back. And she said, uh, Pastor, Knowing what I know now, how can I come back? JJ, knowing what he's to know in Europe, how can he come back to America? Knowing what you know now in the ministry that you're serving, how can you not say, Lord, I'm going to go the rest of the way? It's all up to you. The key is, lies with him. And where God takes you take you to places that you never dreamed of. We're going to sing a song, and I'm just going to ask you, if God has been speaking in your heart, some of you are at that crossroad, high school's about to end, and you're trying to figure out what God wants to do with your life. I'm just going to give you this opportunity. And some of you have heard this word, and maybe you're older, but you've been hearing what God is saying, but you're still not sure. Maybe this it's for you also. Don't, th don't think that you've been going to church and you're a senior citizen. In God's eye, we're all the same. Remember what uh, Caleb said to Joshua. Joshua, don't think because I'm 85, I still can't do anything for the Lord. Give me the hill countries. I'm going to go slay those giants in that hill country. We sing this song. I want you to close your eyes. Think about the message. And let the Spirit of God work in your heart. And if you want to step out in faith, 
in your circle of influence. Say, if you want to take that step and say, Lord, I'm answering your call. Would you tell us, we want to pray with you. Would that you to me to this morning?
hear the prayers night and day, day and night. Father, right now, I pray for those hands that was raised this morning. Minister to the need that they may have. If it's for their walk with you, strengthen that walk. If it's for the filling of your Holy Spirit, fill them, Lord God. If it's for vices that they're dealing with, Lord, in the name of Jesus, break those vices. Break those chains. Whether it be a mental issue, a healing physically, a broken heart, Lord God, you see us, Lord God. You know us, Lord. Father, I pray that you touch them. Maybe someone has a financial issue today. A need that they may have. Lord, you're able to answer. Pray for anyone that needs a healing today. Pray for Sister Janet. Father, we pray. Minister to them. Those that are battling diabetes. In the name of Jesus. Heal them right now, Lord God. Father, we pray your traveling mercies. Pastor Vito, stop by and toy with them. Bring them home safely, Lord God. We continue to pray for Pastor Silva's family. Flow in the children. Lord, let your peace and cover, cover them. Holy Spirit. Father, we lift up our missionary. Pray for JJ and his family, wife and children, as they serve you in Europe, Lord God. And see how important the work that you have called them to do. Open opportunities. Open doors to reach those that need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your provision for them, Lord God, Your anointing continue to be upon James, his wife and his children. Use them, Lord, in places that we can't go, in places where you have called them to go. Father, send them your protection upon them. Shall mercies for them, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your spirit that continues to make a difference in our lives and help us, Lord, to make a difference in your work and in this world. Thank you, Father, for all your blessings. Bless your people today. Help us, Lord, to get rest and come back for our new service tonight. Holy Spirit, show up. Speak a word. Challenge some hearts and minds tonight, Lord God. We thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great lunch. Come tonight and fellowship with us and also with uh, JJ and you. Yeah, my main Lima. We'll talk to some amigos about to vote. Yeah, we might talk to my future about to vote. I don't know. My friend there. I have to the vote. You can take him and some more. I think they said that, but I'm not sure. Amen. God bless you. Have a great uh, afternoon.